Hey, this video took me a ridiculous amount of time to make. So if you end up liking it, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing all at the same time. It was truly a labor of love for a game that deserves it. And I will not be doing a video of this scope for a while. Or at least until I have a lot more time on my hands. So please enjoy. There are a lot of zombie games. George Romero probably had no idea what he was unleashing upon the world when he released Night of the Living Dead in 1968. Even though it wasn't the first to feature zombies as a prominent character, it was the first to create the idea of infectious flesh-eating zombies. And now, the world-famous Dead series is still the undefeated champion of zombie media. And while the human condition of how people act when faced with a crisis and are forced to work together was always the focus of Romero's work, it also introduced the idea of an ever-present threat that never stops to find that one moment to take everything from you. The idea of a single bite, or sometimes even just a scratch sealing your fate, was an intimidating idea, and made people see what it would be like if humans were no longer at the top of the food chain. Many, many, many TV shows and movies would take this idea and either run or walk with it, turning the zombie threat into the primary focus of the story. Some did it well. Shoot that woman or you were dead. You think I'm fucking around, Steve? You're wrong. Now you got till a count of five and that's two you wasted. That's three. Others, not so much. Come on, you know every one of us has wanted to do that. Sorry, I'm a dick, I know this. Now can we please go get drunk? Why is everyone talking funny? But in the end, it was no longer enough to defend yourself from them. Killing one zombie would be akin to taking a single drop of water from an ocean. Being safe was a thing of the past, because at the bottom of the food chain, the best thing you can do is hide and hope they never find you. And the smartest thing you can do is always be vigilant and attentive. Allowing yourself to get comfortable is the same as plugging your ears and closing your eyes, because they're always out there, waiting patiently for their own chance. Now most game devs saw this incredibly bleak, oppressive, captivating atmosphere and thought... Let's make a game where you shoot a fuck of a zombie! Woo! This willing ignorance to incredibly important subtext is why The Wolfman from 1941 is still the best werewolf movie. Growing up in the middle of the zombie genre oversaturation, I naturally played a lot of zombie games. Left 4 Dead, Dead Island, Call of Duty. It was the perfect setting for a fun cooperative experience, but it always felt like there was something missing. Some huge part of all of this that wasn't being focused on. And in almost every single one of these, the fear of a bite was non-existent. Because every time the devs needed to rack their brains to think of a reason why. From being a carrier in Left 4 Dead 2, to having a suppressant in Dying Light in Dead Rising, to just straight up being immune in Dead Island, when you get nibbled on in a AAA zombie game, the most you tend to think is, Ow. Jerk. Even though I maintained the opinion that Left 4 Dead 2 was the best zombie game ever, I felt myself drawn to more independent experiences, such as Zombie Panic Source, Gmod Zombie Survival, and No More Room in Hell. Games where it was more about seeking salvation against a relentless horde rather than just killing them for fun. These games really gave me a taste for what I truly craved. Zombie Panic Source in particular being an incredibly underrated experience. Rest in peace, Zombie Master.
you will be missed. But as I went on, I kept hearing about this game being developed in the background with a weird name. Project Zomboid. I'd seen people play it in its early days, but back then it looked pretty shoddy and I was never really a fan of isometric camera styles so I wrote it off. Many years later after having survived a real worldwide pandemic, it was in the winter of 2023 that I saw the game was growing significantly in popularity. I took note of how seriously the game takes itself despite the out of place cartoon raccoon and thought they were just being overly edgy. Surprised that it was still in early access but curious to know what the fuss was about, I decided to go for it. And as I hit play, I slowly lifted the decaying, fleshy, disease-ridden crown from Left 4 Dead 2's head. Now, its reign had come to an end.
In Project Zomboid, you play as a survivor of the Knox infection, a viral infection that has rapidly spread over the fictional Knox County, Kentucky. As if you guys don't know what a zombie virus is. Having been quarantined from the rest of the world, you can watch on TV or listen on the radio to see how much they claim the situation to be under control. But as the days go on, you watch the media begin to panic, and you start to lose their broadcasts along with power and water, to eventually realize that's not the case. But before we deal with any of that, we gotta jump into the tutorial. Because not only does it teach you the basics of movement and deliver incredibly important information, like how tapping E opens windows but holding E makes you climb through them, good luck getting used to that, but by making you kill your zombified family members, it also constantly reaffirms you the most important lesson, that there is no hope, and in the end you'll end up the same as them. And no moment gets this point across better than this one right here. Last advice, if you ever get a zombie bite or fear one is imminent, then press H and you'll swallow the antidote. Only kidding, all hope is gone. There is no antidote. Have fun! The game tricks you into pressing a key that makes your character shout, alerting every zombie hiding conveniently in the tree line to your location. You'll try to run, you'll try to hide, you might even try to fight, but there is no escaping them, and you'll eventually meet your ultimate fate. perfect allegory for the point of the game itself. When even a game's tutorial is brilliant, you know you can expect a lot from it. Now it's time to see if it can deliver. Deciding to jump into a game yourself, you'll see there are a lot of choices to be made, such as the difficulty modes to fit your gameplay style. You can even utilize the custom sandbox option to adjust the aspects of gameplay in case it's too easy or too hard. There are lots of things to adjust here, like the time of year you start, loot rarity, or if you're an insane masochist the likes of an Elder Souls born Kiro no hit runner, Souls Ball no hit run! You can even change the zombies from Romero-esque shamblers to 28 days later-esque sprinters. And even though I personally always use Apocalypse as a preset, I typically change transmission settings to saliva only, cause otherwise it tends to feel kinda cheap, since scratches and lacerations still have a 7% and 25% chance of infection, respectively. Which means shit like this can happen. Oh no. Oh thank god, it's just a scratch. Are you freaking serious? The most important part of setting up your game though is character creation. No, not just the looks. Here you get to choose what kind of person you were before the Nox event started. Were you a brave firefighter? A grizzled military veteran? or just a simple fast food worker. And every decision you make in this page has huge impact on how you'll survive. But every choice can give or take points. So go ahead, pick as many positive traits as you like. But just know you can't begin if that counter is in the negative. For all the upsides you give your character, you must choose downsides to balance them out before you can even start the game. You want to be a brilliant fit doctor that played baseball in high school? Sure. But now you're also addicted to cigarettes, cowardly, and nearsighted. This whole system is genius and a brilliant incorporation of an RPG mechanic, as it promotes planning, assigning roles to different players in multiplayer, and replayability. The ever popular burglar role, for instance, gives you the ability to hotwire cars right out the gate, regardless of skill. Which, as we'll learn, is an unmistakably powerful ability. So if you've got that character made with your points no longer in the red, all there's left to do is hit start where the game quickly dashes any confidence you may have gained while designing your character to hammer in the point one final time. These are the end times. There was no hope of survival. This is how you died. Well fuck me, video games are supposed to be for fun, right? So the moment you spawn in, you probably think to yourself, Wow, this game's fucking dark. But in reality, the game uses a unique sighting system where the only time things appear on screen is when your character is looking at them, hears them, or remembers that they're there. So if you see something for the first time, then turn away, it'll stay on screen the way your character remembers it. Unless it's something that would logically move from that spot. It might take a bit to get used to at first, but soon it'll become second nature. But you don't have time for that right now. You're just some poor sap all alone in a house during a zombie outbreak. So we gotta prepare. To the kitchen. We gotta find something to defend ourselves. But be quiet and cautious on your way over. Cause you better believe the hungry hordes are right outside. And if you aren't stealthy, they could very well see you through the windows. So if you're ever worried about that, you can use shift click or right click context menu to shut blinds if your window has some. You won't be able to see out, but at least they won't be able to see in. When searching for loot, you can use your mouse to examine any container around your character to see what's inside. And swap items in or out. There can be clothes, food, books, guns, whatever. 
but typically you can expect to find things in logical places, like cigarettes behind a counter at a gas station. Once you've found something to defend yourself with in the kitchen, there's something far more important to check for. The all-important can opener. That's right, this is a survival game, and to survive, you gotta eat. And perishable goods like meats and dairy products can only last so long after you lose power, which means unless you become somewhat self-sufficient through fishing, trapping, or farming, it's canned goods and junk food for you, bucko. And hunger's not the only thing to account for here either. If you don't pay attention to your nutritional intake, such as calories or carbohydrates, you could potentially die of malnutrition Wow. We only just walked into the other room and we've already encountered- ah! Guess we weren't stealthy enough walking into the kitchen because here comes a zombie. Just don't get bit. I got him! Yeah, you may be thinking to yourself, well, that wasn't so hard. And yeah, dispatching of the undead can be pretty easy on their own. All it takes is a good few whacks from a sturdy weapon or a bullet to the brain. You can even press space to push them away if you need some, which may even cause them to fall over, allowing for an easy kill. But that was just one. They're innumerable. And if you're not careful, they can easily overwhelm you. You can run from them, but they never truly tire. But man, you sure will. The more physical activity you perform, the more stamina you use. And you can recover it by resting on the ground or using the rest feature on furniture. But this isn't Dark Souls where running low on stamina means you can't perform certain actions temporarily. No, there are serious consequences to not allowing yourself a chance to rest. And here's where I need to talk about another brilliant concept the game has called Moodles. Moodles are... Oh, oh man. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, Moodles are the mechanic the game uses to quickly and efficiently let you know if there are any abnormalities in your character. Like, see here how I'm in pain, agitated, and queasy? That's not good. Moodles vary in their intensity, too. The more you neglect them, the worse they get. For example, that fatigue Moodle you gained earlier? The longer you have that, the more tired you get. You can think of tired as sleepiness, aka what you get if you've gone too long without sleeping. And this bitch is the real killer right here. Because the sleepier you are, the slower you recover stamina, up until you reach ridiculously tired, where you can't recover stamina at all. And a survivor with both ridiculously tired and exhausted has their cone of vision severely reduced, attacks 28% slower, has a lower chance to resist being grabbed, has a hugely increased chance to trip when climbing fences, walks at only a quarter of their average speed, and deals less than 1% normal damage with melee weapons. So if you're being pursued when this happens, you are all kinds of fucked. Trust me, I know. So now that you're- oh my god, look behind you! Uh-oh. Let's have a look. This is the menu where you can examine the state of your character and tend to wounds through things like disinfected, bandages, suture needles, and splits. Where was I? Oh yeah, speaking of being all kinds of fucked. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it for you. There is absolutely nothing you can do for your character from this point on. Sure, it's just a wound right now, but eventually you'll start getting sick and catch a fever, which will eventually kill you, and then wake up a new man, but not in a good way. At this point, the game doesn't force you to start a new save or new world or anything. It just asks you to make a new character. And this is yet another genius concept. Your previous character wasn't special or anything. I mean, he was technically immune to the airborne strain of the virus, but he was just another one of the thousands of people who died in a similar circumstance. You realize this when you make a new character, because you remember where your previous one bit the dust so you can recover your items. It's like coming across an old friend that you spent so much time with and overcame adversities alongside, now zombified, except it's you. And these moments tend to make fans emotional. It's another way the game brilliantly emulates zombie movies, by giving the player the classic zombie movie scene where someone must be put down.
That's why a lot of players who play the same save for a long time choose to find it an enclosed space to drink bleach once they're bit so their zombified character doesn't wander off making it harder to recover their items. But I'd have to call you foolish and naive if you think, okay, I'll just raid the nearest police station and become so armed and fierce that no zombie will have a chance at gnawing on me. Just like in other zombie games. But. Not only do guns have considerable weight and restrictions on how you equip them, but if you choose to fire a gun, you better be prepared to deal with the consequences. Cause in case you don't know... Guns are loud. Zombies are generally attracted to noise more than I'm attracted to a funnel cake stand whenever I'm at a fair, which is the entire reason I'm there. Even if you have a bit of aiming skill and can actually hit the broadside of a barn, the sound of a gunshot carries a far greater distance than you'd expect. So you have to be extremely picky in deciding when to use them, because the moment you do, you'll begin to be pursued by zombies you didn't even know were there. Small caliber guns have a relatively tame rapport, but if you decide to fire a shotgun, well, I just hope you have the ammunition to back that decision up. But these noises can be used to your advantage too, because when they hear a noise coming from your spot, they don't immediately know you're there, they're just heading to the spot they heard it from. So through the use of noises and clever pathing manipulation, you can make them go right where you want them. And you're probably going to want a well-fortified base to run to as well in case things get dicey. Because with the carpentry skill, I'm not going to go over all the skills because there are too many, you can take advantage of the game's fantastic building mechanics. You can do things like barricade windows, build rain collectors, gates for your cars, and even build your own house out in the middle of the woods like a hermit if you want to. And this mechanic is not tacked on. It helps a great deal with survival. Not only in seeking refuge from the dead, but also in surviving winter when that comes along. Man, wouldn't it be a shame to freeze to death after all your efforts? Cause that's gonna happen unless you prepare. You start the game in the middle of July, so you have plenty of time, but your reward for surviving a full five and a half months, which is way harder than it sounds, especially in single player, is a long, harsh winter where you'll have to scrounge for winter wear and forego protection just to not freeze to death, as well as constantly stockpiling mountains of food like a grizzly bear with an eating disorder. You spend basically the entirety of the year preparing for winter, and to be honest, I still haven't experienced it myself. Good luck grabbing a significant amount of anything without a car, by the way. Even though you can grab bigger and bigger bags to carry your crap with, it still ain't gonna be enough for a lot of things. What, are you just gonna stuff that old generator in your pocket, you dunce? Plus, needless to say, a car will help you get around this huge world. Cars aren't always easy to come by, though. First, you gotta find one that isn't completely totaled and won't die on you while you're in the middle of a zombie horde. Then you gotta find a key for it. Sometimes it's as easy as finding it in the ignition, and other times you gotta search a house it's parked in front of or the pockets of nearby zombies and hope you get lucky because even when there's a completely pristine car parked right in front of a home the key will be nowhere to be found then you gotta give it gas from gas stations or siphon it from cars. But don't think of cars as some sort of invincibility button though. In fact, you're more vulnerable. If you allow them, zombies will repeatedly attack your windows, eventually breaking them, allowing them to reach through and attack. And remember to keep your speed under control too, especially if you have the speed demon trait, because that can easily end in disaster. Or I guess if you just want a near endless supply of goods, you could just move to Louisville. As I'm sure you're aware of, in a world of zombies, the bigger the town population, the more zombies will be present in it. West Point, for instance, is the second largest town on the map, and this place is covered in them. You're gonna want to plan if you come here. But what's this place I'm hearing of just north of here? Dear God. And did I mention this game has a massive modding scene? Yeah! As if the game wasn't customizable enough. You got weapon mods, vehicle mods, clothing mods, mods to change game mechanics, mods to make the game easier, mods to make the game harder, mods to change the entire in-game world, and of course, the ever-important nude mod. Ah, uh, excuse me. Let's get ready for my next character. And you may be confused and wondering why I never talked about the game's ending. And to that I say, did Spiffo really not drill into your head enough? Indie Stone stays 100% true to their promise. There was no hope of survival. That does indeed mean what you think it means. The story of your character only ends in their death, which I'm sure could be a deal breaker to some people. But for me, 
That's a ballsy decision, and technically there is no ending more final than that. And besides, if you do have a problem, the modding community's got you covered. But in conclusion, I really don't have any problems saying that this is not only the best zombie game ever made, in my opinion, but the best survival game ever made as well. And you know, it's only going to get better from here. The devs are so devoted to making it great that ever since the game released on Early Access, it has still been getting updates since, which is incredible. They're constantly updating the community on progress of future updates. The next of which is adding, among other things, huntable animals. They've already stated numerous times that NPCs, both good and bad, will make it into the game at a later date. And there's still a ridiculous amount of space on the other side of the Ohio River just waiting to be used. I can't think of another indie game with so much potential. This game is great as it is, but will only get better and better with time. Do not miss out. I suppose that's all I really have left to say at this point, so... I'm Jude Blooper. Have fun. Anyway, I'm Chief Balupa. Have a good one.